Hello, everyone. This afternoon, President Trump will deliver remarks on rolling back regulations to help all Americans. Deregulation has been a top priority of this president. The president reversed the disastrous overregulation of the Obama Biden administration. Under President Trump, seven deregulatory actions have been taken for every one new regulation. This amounted to $50 billion in regulatory cost savings. And it is important to note that this deregula deregulation agenda lowers the cost for every American. The cost of these burdensome regulations fall disproportionately and benefit disproportionately lower income Americans. So this president took action uh, to roll back the burdensome regulations that harm low income communities uh, and make sure that these lower income Americans are taken care of. Um, for example, the president's deregulatory agenda will boost household in income by $3,000 $1,100 annually. Thanks to President Trump's rolling back of the Obama Biden era cafe standards, family, uh, families will have access to cheaper cars. The president's health care deregulation will also save patients nearly 10% on prescription drug costs. These real wins for the American people will disappear with a re regulation agenda, which is why President Trump will continue to pursue his historic deregulation activity. On another note, we saw encouraging news yesterday on vaccines. Moderna's vaccine candidate is showing promising signs. It produced a positive, neutral immune response among the 45 participants in the study. This is comparable to what we see in recovered patients. And the bottom line is that so far we are seeing exactly what you would hope to see in a vaccine. Uh, they're expected, the Moderna uh, vaccine in particular, is expected to reach phase three by late July with 30,000 participants. And finally, on the therapeutics front, I just want to note a very encouraging Regeneron contract, a $450 million contract for monoclonal antibody cocktail. This is a bioengineered version of convalescent plasma, uh, it, one of the several therapeutics available to treat COVID. It uh, can be used for prophylaxis and treatment, and they say they could have up to 70 to 300,000 uh, uh, vials of this by the end of the summer or early fall. Uh, so Operation Warp Speed continues. We continue to see encouraging news on the therapeutics front. And with that, I will take your questions. Jeff. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan said today that President Trump has left states to fend for themselves during this pandemic. He accused the president of not listening to medical experts. That is quite a takedown coming from a Republican governor. Yeah, it's really striking, um, his comments, especially when you compare them to his past comments. This is revisionist history by Governor Hogan, and it stands in stark contrast uh, to what he said on March 19th, uh, where he praised the great communication that the president has had with governors. On March 19th, he also said, thank you, there's been tremendous cooperation. And what is so striking to me about reading that op-ed is Governor Hogan begins with this dramatic April 18th scene where South Korea uh, delivered tests. Um, but just the day prior, he said something entirely different. He, in fact, thanked the president for the progress we've seen in federal and state coordination in recent weeks and went on to praise testing capabilities. He said with regard to some of the top needs of states, including ventilators and testing capabilities. So 24 hours before uh, this dramatic opening scene of his op-ed, he literally was praising the president of the United States for delivering on testing. And how do you explain that President Trump is trailing his opponent by double digits both nationally and in battleground states with majorities disapproving of his handling of race relations and the coronavirus response? So that would be a question for the campaign when it comes to uh, campaign polling. But what I would say is we believe this president has great approval in this country. His historic COVID response speaks for itself with delivering on ventilators and testing, leading the world uh, in the amount of testing we've provided, therapeutics, the 13 vaccine candidates, the Moderna example that I pointed out to you. This president's response has been historic, uh, and we believe his support in this country reflects that. But with pertaining to battleground polling or campaign-related polling, I'd refer you there. Yes. Haley, we've seen the president hold a range of public events this week, but none of those events have been focused on the coronavirus. Why not? The president's routinely focused on the coronavirus. I think you'll be hearing more um, about what we're doing in the coming week. He's hard at work. We talk about COVID every day from this podium. Uh, the task force is hard at work, and I'm, I'm glad you asked about COVID in particular because I just want to 
um, read through some of the um, things that we are doing, uh, which I think is most, most important than what we're saying is what we're doing. Um, and the White House has engaged in travel. Dr. Burks um, to Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. I spoke with Dr. Burks this morning. She's in Georgia today. Heading to South Carolina tomorrow, HHS has deployed 19 teams across the country. We identify not um, where we see embers, but pre that. We identify where we might see an emergence, and we send teams there to address it in advance. So we're proactive. Um, the, uh, Dr. Burks routinely sends real-time data to governors. She gives them governor's uh, reports on remdesivir. We've surged it to Texas, Florida, California, Arizona. Uh, 65,000 vials went to these four states and we're also uh, surging testing sites. So we're doing stuff each and every day. But Kaylee, surely you would agree this is the biggest challenge facing the public right now. Why are we seeing it as the president's biggest public priority? The president's focusing on, on a lot. Look, the president just yesterday uh, held a, a, a big um, press conference, if you will, or an avail in the Oval, Oval Office about MS-13. Um, COVID is something that we're focused on. It is a top priority of this administration. It's why the task force meets. It's why I mentioned to you we're taking all those steps. But there are other things the president has to focus on, namely Democrat cities not controlling their streets, namely uh, the mayor of Chicago, um, people dying in her in her, on the streets of her city every weekend, and the president sent her a letter saying, you must secure your city. Uh, the president's involved in Operation Legend in honor of Legend Tal Talaferro, a young man who lost his life, sending federal assistance to St. Louis, an, a, a city that has asked for our help, uh, and he's shown up. The president's focused on MS-13, who um, tragically maimed and killed those two young little girls, uh, and he's held their killer accountable, the leader uh, of that ring. So the president's focused on COVID. It's a top priority. He's focused on the violence in the streets. He's doing a lot of things at once, and that's the great thing about the Trump administration. Ms. Buckley, when's yes. the last time he attended a task force briefing? The president is briefed on coronavirus each and every day. Yes, Darlene. Thank you. Does the White House agree that it's not helpful for people to wait seven days or longer to get the results of their coronavirus tests? And is, and is the White House going to do anything to try to shorten those wait times so that people can get their results sooner? So we've done more than any country in the world on testing. There's no doubt about that. 42 million tests. Uh, the country with the next highest number is India at 12 million. There are various different types of tests in this country. Some take longer to process than others, but we have surged testing to the states. Uh, and we encourage them to use it uh, to their best ability and to process those tests as quickly as possible. Thank yes, you. Thank you. To follow up on that, it's not just about the quantity of testing. It's about the quality of testing. So. Is the administration doing anything specifically to make all the tests out there return quicker results? Because, you know, a lot of health experts are worried that when people have to wait seven days or longer, they're, they're out here spreading the disease unknowingly. So as I noted, there are several different types of tests. There's the Abbott rapid response test. There are other tests that take longer. Dr. Burks and Admiral Joie are constantly out there advising on testing and how to process these tests. Ultimately, we can give the states the supplies, but they've got to use them in the best way possible to get results as quickly as possible. But rest assured, our team's fully engaged from Admiral Joie uh, to Dr. Burks and others. Um, and Admiral Joie shared with me, we have 552 sites testing in America in 48 states and the District of Columbia. 65% of these sites are located in counties with moderate to high social vulnerability, uh, and 201 additional sites will be going live this week. And that's on top of the 1,300 federally qualified health centers that are out there testing as well, and the commercial testing sites at CBS. I have another question, Kaylee. In an interview with CBS News, President Trump said more white people are killed as an answer to why black people are still being killed by police officers. But by population percentages, black people are about three times more likely than white people to die in a police encounter. If the president won't even acknowledge that, how can he fix the problem? The president has routinely acknowledged and expressed the absolute um, atrocity of the case of George Floyd, uh, and his heart goes out to that family still. Um, he was noting a, a fact um, that there were, a, when you look at unarmed killings with police interactions in this country, that you had nine unarmed black individuals who were fatally shot and 19 unarmed white individuals. That's down from 38 and 32, respectively, in 
2015. So the numbers have actually come down uh, since the Obama administration. He was making that point. But one point he wants to strongly make is this, uh, that black men and women who die of homicide, they are likely to die of homicide at eight times greater uh, than that of white individuals and Hispanics combined. Uh, that, that's the rate combined. So that's an extraordinary thing that we want to look at. I've listed for you the names of these kids who have died across this country. It is unacceptable. And under this president, he'll take action. And the derelict mayor of Chicago should step up and ask for federal help because she's doing a very poor job at securing her streets. We're talking about people yes. who are dying at the hands of police officers. Yes. Is the president considering uh, travel bans for members of the Communist Party uh, to enter the U.S.? And is he concerned about escalation of tensions with China? So I have um, no announcements on that front, but um, rest assured we keep every option on the table with regard to China. Has he ruled out any, op any options at all? He's not ruled out any options with regard to China. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kaylee. Does the White House have a reaction to the hacking of Twitter last night? And do you have any broader concerns, or does the President have any broader concerns about using that platform to issue not only his own opinions, but official policy pronouncements, given its apparent vulnerability to hacking? Yeah, so I uh, spoke with Dan Scavino before coming out here. My team did. Um, and Dan has been, and his team and digital have been in constant contact with Twitter over the last 18 hours to keep Twitter uh, secure, the president's Twitter feed. Um, the president will remain on Twitter, but his account was secure and not jeopardized during these attacks. Okay, and just one follow up to Luigi's question. I guess I didn't follow the data that you were just referring to. Are you saying that the president did have data to back up his claim? that more white people are killed by police officers than black people? Yeah, and I've already read out that data to you. I don't think we yes. followed it. I've didn't. already read out that data to you, and you can go fact check on the Washington Post. Yes. Anyway, uh, two quick questions. First, Congressman uh, Steve Watkins of Kansas has been charged with three felonies in a voter fraud case. Uh, obviously, the president campaigned with him in 2018, and he's repeatedly uh, expressed concern with voter fraud. So does he have a reaction to that? Um, I've, that's the first I'm hearing of that. I haven't spoken to the president of it. Um, he does have very real concerns about voter fraud, um, and he's mentioned several of those. Um, and there's yet more information uh, that there is rampant voter fraud when you have mass mail-in voting. In 2016, as the president has noted, about 1 percent of absentee ballots nationwide were thrown out, and it could be much higher this year as many people vote by mail for the first time. That's one of the flaws with mass mail-in voting. Um, but beyond that, um, we've seen a a number of reports out of New Jersey that found a U.S. Postal Service vehicle that may have been carrying mail-in ballots that were that was caught on fire. This truck, uh, this was recent. Also, uh, in the New Jersey Star Ledger on June 22nd, this was very striking. 500 to 700 Republicans received ballots with all Democrat candidates. They were erroneous mail-in ballots that had been voided and then reissued. Uh, and the slate of candidates on these ballots was all Democrat, from Joe Biden down to dog catcher. And these were supposed to be Republican ballots. Those are three recent examples, and there are many more. Uh, quick, yes. A quick second question, Kaylee. Uh, when the President made uh, the initial decision to move the Republican National Convention from Charlotte to Florida, he said that it was because the North Carolina governor was in a shutdown mood and that he was playing politics because he didn't want to pack uh, an indoor stadium to full capacity. He also said that the cost to North Carolinians would be, and I'm quoting the President now, all of the jobs and the economic development the, con the convention would bring. So all of that money, all of that time, all of that cost to jobs and economic development to North Carolinians for the same result, right? Because they're shrinking the convention in Florida. What does the president have to say to North Carolinians? The president loves the people of North Carolina. They're well aware of that. Uh, the president wanted to be able to hold his convention, which is why it was moved to Jacksonville. And for anything further, I'd refer you to the RNC. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, the president has talked about an executive order on immigration coming soon. He's also talked about protections for DACA recipients. It's been unclear, though, whether uh, those protections, the path to citizenship that the president talked about, will be included in the executive order. So I was hoping you could clarify 
Will the path to citizenship protections for China be part of the executive order? So what I would say is this, as the president announced, he's working on an executive order to establish a merit-based immigration system. That will be the intent of the executive order. Um, but the president has long said that he would look for a legislative solution on DACA, and he would work with Congress uh, to pursue that legislative solution, uh, and one that could include citizen citizenship, along with other strong border security and permanent merit-based reforms. So that is something he would work with Congress on, yeah, and the executive okay. order would pertain to the merit-based portion of that. A second question on uh, the schools. Uh, the president, the vice president, talked about some of the gui new guidelines or new pages of documents for CDC coming out this week. Is that still the plan? Are those going to come out this week? Is there any chance that uh, this is being rethought at this time? So those are CDC guidelines you're referencing. So I'll leave it to I'll leave it to CDC as to when those guidelines come out. Uh, but we really would like to see schools open. Um, as has been clear, we don't think our children should be locked up at home with devastating consequences when it's perfectly uh, safe for them to go to school, as emphasized by many medical experts. So the president is very keen on seeing schools re reopen. It's the only thing that's fair to America's children. Yes. Thanks, Kaylee. Uh, two quick questions for you. On Wednesday, the CDC director said, "quote." If all of us would put on a face covering now for the next four weeks, six weeks, I think we could drive this epidemic into the ground. Admiral Girard, Girard has made similar comments. Uh, the CDC director called it our, quote, major defense. I'm wondering if the president would consider at any point a nationwide mask mandate. Well, the president has said that he would wear a mask if he was in a place where he couldn't be appropriately social distanced. He did wear a mask this weekend um, when he visited the hospital. So he has shown that you know he'll wear a mask, and not only that, uh, that he would wear one if he wasn't socially distanced, as evidenced by his own actions. Uh, we leave it to localities to make the decisions when, with regard to face coverings, and the CDC guidelines remain the same today, recommended but not required. And a quick, quick we, second question for you. Um, you were saying earlier that the president is very concerned about local officials who are not taking actions about you know, deaths in their cities. You also said he was appalled by what happened to George Floyd. Um, in March, a 26-year-old black woman named Breonna Taylor was killed while sleeping in her home. Uh, the three officers involved in that case in Kentucky have not been arrested or fired. Is the president monitoring that case at all, and does he want to see justice for Breonna Taylor? Yeah, I won't weigh into that other than to say I'd refer you to the DOJ, uh, who takes federal action where necessary, um, where the facts merit, but our hearts grieve um, for uh, Breonna Taylor's family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question on China. Uh, president Trump is on the only U.S. president to have a stood strong against China, uh, which is of great comfort to countries like India and his other allies in the Asian, Asian neighborhood. Uh, does he have a message to China on this? And has he spoken to China, other countries, uh, how to collaborate against China? Yeah, thank you, Lilith. I did see your question um, earlier, and I brought it to the president. And he said, I love the people of India, and I love the people of China, and I want to do everything possible to keep the peace for the people. Thank you. Yes, uh, two, a question that flows from two events that we saw recently. Uh, that we wouldn't have seen at previous White Houses. The first was the uh, campaign meeting in the cabinet room last month, and then the political speech in the uh, Rose Garden this week. Can you talk about your understanding of what the White House policy is for this White House as far as politics? Is there any place in the White House where you think politics is inappropriate? I mean, where, where do you? Where do you draw the line? We act in accordance with the Hatch Act. It's well established that the president and vice president are not subject to the Hatch Act. It says this much in the Hatch Act. Uh, it says that the Hatch Act applies to executive branch employees, which is defined uh, in the Hatch Act as employee, meaning any individual other than the president and the vice president. So his That's speech not my in the question. Rose Garden was entirely appropriate. The Hatch Act has nothing to do with, the Hatch Act has oh, to do with this, though. What? It has, it has everything to do with this. Go read the Hatch Act. That's what you're alleging is problematic well, no, for I'm the just president. Stating but no, what you, no. what your real problem was was the fact that the president gave a, a very good, powerful speech from the Rose Garden. Owen. Well, you talked about it earlier with school districts, but we're seeing more school districts, at least in Virginia, for example, last night, deciding to go online only. What does the president say to parents out there who are now going, okay, what do I do with my kids? 
Yeah, the president has said um, unmistakably that he wants schools to open, and I was just in the Oval talking to him about that. And when he says open, he means open and full, kids being able to attend each and every day at their school. Uh, the science should not stand in the way of this. Uh, and as Dr. Scott Atlas said, I thought this was a good quote. Of course we can do it. Everyone else in the Western world, our peer nations, are doing it. We are the outlier here. Uh, the science is very clear on this. Uh, that, you know, for instance, you look at the JAMA pediatric study of 46 pediatric hospitals in North America that said the risk of critical illness from COVID is far less for children than that of seasonal flu. The science is on our side here, uh, and we encourage for localities and states to just simply follow the science, open our schools. It's very damaging to our children. There's a lack of reporting of abuse. Uh, there's mental uh, depressions that are not addressed, suicidal ideations that are not addressed when students are not in school. Our schools are extremely important. They're essential, and they must reopen. Yes. Thanks, Kaylee. Uh, the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. today accused Russia of trying to hack coronavirus research, uh, vaccine research. I was wondering if the president has a response to Russia for that. Yes, yeah, so the one thing I would say about that, um, and it was um, made, it was announced earlier today, uh, is that we worked very closely with our allies um, to ensure uh, that we would take measures to keep that information safe, and we continue to do so, and we're aware of those activities. Yes, Chanel. Uh, thanks, Gary. On the CDC, on the movement of data going straight from CDC to HHS now, um, understanding that HHS needs access to real-time data, uh, was there also any concern whatsoever undergirding this decision regarding CDC's uh, possible manipulation of data? There were some reports coming out of Florida. Certain states were coming out and saying mid-level CDC um, reports were not necessarily uh, accurate. And so was that, did that have any effect in this decision to send data straight to HHS? No, the intent for uh, this decision, and I talked extensively today with Dr. Burks, um, with Secretary Azar, um, and with Dr. Redfield about this. Um, the intent of this is we need to make sure that there is daily data that is being given to Dr. Burks and others who are running point on a lot of our actions with remdesivir and identifying hotspots. Uh, and I would point out, and I just want to explain this because I think there's been some confusion in the press. Uh, that there are two methods of data collection. The one is the National Healthcare Safety Network, and this is a CDC system, uh, and this is where hospitals voluntarily report their data, and about 81% of hospitals were reporting their data. So we don't need 81% of hospitals reporting data. We need 100% of hospitals reporting data because it is critical that Dr. Burks and others receive uh, the daily admissions, ICU use, and PPE numbers. And um, when you're only getting 81% of hospital data. That means you've got 19% of hospitals that were unaware of their needs. So what happened is we also have a second method of, of using, of tracking this data, and it's the Teletracker database, and this is an HHS system. And this was initially used for purposes of provider relief funding, and we asked hospitals to tell us about their COVID admissions so that we could identify possible hotspots. And as it turns out, this data uh, ended up being more complete, more up-to-date with information. And so um, in Ensuring that hospitals are reporting into this system where we're getting more complete data uh, was the reason that HHS um, has had this transition where they've asked hospitals to transition reporting to the teletractor, teletracker system. Um, it's important, especially with remdesivir distribution, that we know exactly where the needs are so we can surge them. So uh, this still have access to this data. Yes, that's right. So um, I, I did confirm that with Dr. Redfield, that this is completely open source data available to the CDC. Uh, Secretary Azar says we insist that they use it. Um, and no one, and, and Dr. Redfield confirmed this, no one is taking access or data away from the CDC. And that data is routinely published so that the American people are fully informed. Yes. Um, so I wanted to follow on that briefly. Uh, there's been some complaints, particularly among um, independent modelers who are using the CDC data that was updated daily to sort of put out their public models, some of which the White House mm -hmm. has relied on, that now those dashboards have been taken down. So I'm wondering if uh, the administration would sort of commit to 
making the broader database a bit more available to the public. The CDC database um, is the public data that's been out there. Uh, it'll continue to be public. It should be public. Um, and this is all about getting more data out there, uh, not less data, and ensuring it, in particular that our doctors get that daily data. Um, and one thing that I'd also like to point out for everyone um, is just with regard to testing, we've done more than 42 million tests, as I noted. The second highest number is 12 million from India. Uh, we're leading the world in testing. And it's a very stark contrast, and the President mentioned this yesterday, so I just wanted to um, put some, uh, some additional information out there. It was actually CBS reporting that in 2009, under Obama-Biden, quote, and this is CBS reporting, CDC abruptly advised states to stop testing for H1N1 flu and stop counting individual cases. So while this president surged testing under the Obama administration, they stopped testing entirely. Uh, and Ron Klain, Vice President Biden's former chief of staff, said this, it is purely a fortuity that H1N1 isn't one of the great mass casualty events in American history. It had nothing to do with us doing anything right. This is former VP Biden's chief of staff. It just had to do with luck. Uh, contrary to that, this president led the world in testing, led the world in ventilators, redistributing ventilators, four therapeutics, 13 vaccine candidates, one going into phase three clinical trial. This response has been extraordinary and historic. We didn't pause testing. The Obama-Biden administration did, and that was a shameful decision. Thank you.